once you have your first big hit with an artist such as Susie Quattro, the pressure was on. She's obviously got the goods. Uh, you can't let her down. This thing popped into my head, 48 Crash. Mike Chapman continued to write for Susie, although even she didn't always know what she was singing about. He would take phrases like, can it. In America, you say, oh, can it. Can it, can it can. For years, people have been asking me, what does can the can mean? Well, I don't know any more than they do. Devil go to drive, I bet he doesn't know where that is either. I do. It's just on the borders of Shropshire. Forty-eight crash actually did end up having a bit of a meaning. It was my way of saying that when you reach the age of forty-eight, it's, it's all over. Life is over. Thank God I don't think that way now. The silk sash bash was uh, putting on the dressing gown with the silk sash, and, but it had a, a somewhat of a, a depth in the lyric. Forty-eight crash was Susie's second top five hit proving that a girl could make it in a man's world of glam rock. She was the biggest pinup for every guy, but the great thing about Susie Quattro is every girl wanted to be her as well. Any female artist in the mid to late 70s who is at all serious about success, one of their heroes was Susie Quattro. Susie Quattro was an inspiration because I used to just love to watch her perform. Great songs, great voice, great image, just different. All over the world, we'd get girls coming up and they bought a bass and would she sign it. I think she was quite an influence. Talent, see, always rises. Susie went on to have 16 hit singles, but when her teen audience moved on, so did she. She was getting older, and I figured, well, if her fans are following her, they're getting older too. There's no point hammering away at the same stuff. It's good to move in another direction, which we did. Towards the end of the 70s, she acquired this legendary status. And of course, once you're a legend, that's it, you're, you're all over. Like Noddy and David Bowie, Susie also turned her attention to acting including a role on the American comedy hit series, Happy Days. But her first love would always be music. If you don't feel from your head to your toe immersed in what you're doing, you really should just retire. Today, she's gone back to her rock and roll roots and continues to blaze a trail for women in the male-dominated world of rock. And I always say I'll never retire. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop when I drop tell you the truth. On the record, the leather jumpsuit still fits. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Although glam was a very British phenomenon, the sound was huge everywhere, except in the USA. Today we have over 400 Americans who are rotting in the jails of North Vietnam. Since the mid-60s, America had been fighting a controversial war in Vietnam. This didn't sit well with the fun and frivolous glam rock tradition. But one British star was to wrap 50s rock and roll up in a whole new glam package. Now, my next guest once called himself the Electric Liberace, but Liberace never wore windscreen wipers on his sunglasses, did he? Step forward, the showbiz king, Elton John. I remember when rock was young, me and Susie had so much fun. Reginald Dwight was born in the heart of the suburbs in northeast London. A child prodigy, he was able to play any tune he had and built a career on it. Started off working in pubs. And so I guess that's maybe where the, the strength came, you know, to, hello, I'm playing the piano, you know, put your beer down, have a listen. By 1967, Elton was playing in a small group called Bluesology when he teamed up with a fresh new songwriter. Can I have a, a, a warm hand, please, for Bernie Torpin? 
he's probably more important than me when it comes to writing the songs because he has to write the words before I write the music. If I was a sculptor, <laughs> then again, no. Or a man who makes potions in the traveling show. It was a very, very close relationship, a platonic, a sort of brotherly relationship. They shared a, a room at Elton's mum's flat in Pinner. Um, they had little bunk beds, and um, every night they would go off to sleep like sort of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet in this little room. And you can tell everybody this is your song. It was a very sweet, innocent existence. Bernie wrote your song, which was the real breakthrough Elton John song. He wrote the lyric um, at the kitchen table. I hope you don't mind, I hope you don't mind that I put down in a word. Your song was a top ten hit for Elton and Bernie, but Elton had bigger ambitions. I think Elton, you had to make a little bit more of an effort if you were going to compete with the Bowies and the Bolands, and so he let the kind of inner queen come out. Here we go. Elton just opened the gates to all that glam. He was bursting the confines of his childhood by wearing very large bunches of bananas and windscreen wipers on his glasses. Elton wasn't exactly the kind of guy you'd look at and go, wow, he looks like a star. He's this little sort of chubby guy and uh, he has no uh, idea where to put his foot or his anything next. So he had to do something with himself. Elton was happy to put on that coat of glam, transforming himself from a singer-songwriter into a king of glam rock. You have to take yourself lightheartedly because there has to be a lighter side and you have to communicate with an audience. Very few groups do nowadays. And they were playing to massive crowds. These were arenas and things. We didn't have the big screens up at that time, so they had to be spotted. And where else would you spot someone but in sequin? It's just like a Dodger suit, only it's all sequined it's up. Tight fitting. Yeah, and then he's got this hat. <laughs> He actually had an outfit that was that had lights in it, and uh, he was sweating so much it fused. I went to see him. I thought my costumes were wild, and I thought at the end of the day, you can look great, but you got to have a good sun. But as soon as he sat at the piano, he would forget what he was wearing, and he would just hammer out the music. By 1972, Elton was writing tracks with the traditional glam theme of space travel. Rocket Man from his number one hit album, Honky Tonk Chateau. Up until now, glam had been a British phenomenon, but Elton brought his rock and roll roots and outrageous stage persona to the States, and the Americans were hooked. To get on stage with 120,000 people, I don't even remember part of it because I was so scared. <laughs> Elton was number one, the highest grossing touring artist in the world at the time, so he had nothing to prove other than he wanted to be, be fantastic. By the mid-70s, he had 11 hit albums on both sides of the Atlantic, including his hit version of Pinball Wizard from the rock opera Tommy. But away from the stadium, Elton was struggling with his fame. He was determined he was going to be normal. He wasn't going to be affected by all the hype and all the conceit and all the vanity. But of course, ultimately, it did overcome him. When you're in your early and mid-twenties, you just live for the moment. And of course, there was a price to be paid. His own sexual identity lay at the root of his unhappiness. When he and Bernie Torpin were showing a flat in London, he was actually engaged, uh, a woman who was the heiress to a pickled onion fortune and was much taller than he was, and he felt very trapped by this, and uh, he thought the only way out was to commit suicide. Bernie always says he only turned the gas oven on to low, and he'd taken a, a cushion to rest his head on inside the gas oven, so we can take it he expected to be rescued. Oh, it's a sad, sad, sad. 
By 1976, Elton was telling journalists he was bisexual. It would be many years and a failed marriage later before he finally came out as a gay man. By now, the glam rock era was almost over, but for Elton, it had worked its magic and launched what was to become a remarkable international career. That whole glam thing was a big deal because his drive was to be the best songwriter, to be the best singer, to be the best piano player, to sell the most tickets, to make the most money, whatever it took to be the top. Over the next three decades, Elton John went on to become one of the most successful solo artists ever. The showmanship he cultivated at the height of glam rock has remained one of his defining features. Superstar, great music, great lyrics. Thank God for Elton John. Today, many of our biggest stars have dipped into Glam's dressing up box. Where is your love? But they Don't couldn't have done it without love. those original Don't kings of Glam. The Queens of Disco strut their funky stuff next Friday at 10.35 on BBC One. A stellar classic album on BBC Two now, Simply Red's Dars. Thank you.